All right, uh, this session, tech session 57 for DevNet Create is me rocking the Meraki dashboard API. I'm Jason Davis. I'm a distinguished engineer at Cisco and in our DevNet organization. I've been here for over 20 years and I've worked with hundreds of customers on network management operations, automation orchestration and virtualization. And for our Cisco Live events, when we have them, I also get to work in the NOC. So that's something I enjoy doing, but I really enjoy reaching out and meeting people like you. What we're gonna to talk today about is a project that I worked on for a customer. And uh, it's a bit of a show and tell, but beyond that, it's a show and share because you will have access to this code after I've uh, finished presenting it. And you'll have QR codes and URL links to get to it. And we'll talk about the situation we ran into, how we proposed solving it, and how we iterated through it a few times. So our situation was that we were dealing with a financial services customer that had Meraki gear and they were pretty happy with it. Uh, they also had a really large IT environment uh, and service team that was really familiar with all their ITIL and TOGAF methodologies. And you know, at one point here comes their auditors saying it's time for us to do audits. And uh, they're thinking, hey, it's time to pull out proof of compliance. So, hey, we can do that, it's pretty easy. Let's just go download the configs. Well, um, unfortunately, there are no configs to download and review. <coughs> so the customer said, well, you know, that's okay. We'll just give the auditor logins and access to thousands of Meraki networks and devices. Well, the one thing you don't wanna do is make your auditor unhappy, okay? because if you have a cranky auditor, you may not pass that audit. So we said, let's think about this a little bit. Our first attempt was, let's write some Python code to extract that public Meraki dashboard API and do REST API calls. And, you know, we're gonna store this information and capture it in JSON format, which is my favorite format. JSON joke, get it? All right. We won't do that one too many more times, possibly. Well, you take that JSON data and we put it in a Git repo. So now we've got this information archived, it's diffable, and it's scannable. So we can start to do some of those things that check for certain policies and rules that we've defined. And the API is really well documented. It's here at this link I'm sharing. And one thing to note is that it's very hierarchical and indexed on organization and ID, network ID, and device ID. And those are the three primary uh, indices that you may deal with. But you may be getting into other ones around interface, client IDs, port, or VLANs. So if you run into those, you might have to add additional code to handle that logic and create loops. The two URLs that you're seeing here are the network API methods. And you can see that organization ID is the primary key. And that gives us a list of all the networks in that organization or the devices that are in that organization. If we look closer at that documentation, what we're gonna see is the get organizations method doesn't have any parameters or APIs that we, uh, or API methods that we need to define. It's dependent on your API key and the access that you have for authentication. And it'll list out all of the networks and all the organizations and the organization IDs that you have access to. And you just extract that and you have that available. When we have that, then we can move on to something like, show me all of my organization's networks, okay? And if we look at that API documentation, we can see that the parameter for this API call does require us to specify the organization ID. And then we get that information back out also as JSON. So first iteration through this, we had thousands of networks and devices that were in this customer's environment. And so our first pass experience was that it took 57 hours to get through all that information. Well, and why is that? Well, because Meraki was doing API rate limiting to five calls a second. Now, good news in the last month, this summer, Meraki has enhanced that limit to 10. So you could potentially cut your work in half 
if you're using older scripts that were dealing with the five API limit. Well, why does this take so long this way? When we think about looking at this from a task flow perspective, our original view of this was doing work sequentially. And if we do a, a walk, run, fly approach, we're gonna take a pretty easy sequential uh, aspect to this. So initially you've got some work that your processor is doing. It passes that off to another server through an API call, and then you're waiting. And then you get the result back and then more work for you on your processor. And then you do another request and more waiting and back and forth and back and forth and all that sequential work stacked up. Remember thousands of devices, thousands of networks, hundreds of possible API calls all done in a sequence, a sequence means a long time. So there were other challenges that we also had to deal with. How do we find and track all the get API requests and endpoints. And what happens when those APIs change? We wanna make sure we're capturing all these settings and true to form, the Meraki team had eight different releases in this past year. Well, I guess they're working in an agile model. <laughs> they're doing a lot of work. We also have to think, isn't it inefficient to pull unsupported features for equipment that don't use them? So we needed to figure out ways of updating our logic. So how do we speed this up? Ideally, I wanted to get around 12 hours of overall work so we could run this once a day. We didn't want it to take more than 24 hours. Well, could we do multi-processing? Sure, if we had systems with uh, multi-core processors. Um, multi-processing is great for CPU bound kind of work like Bitcoin mining. Um, but essentially, you'd be spinning up multiple Python interpreters and doing them in parallel with no understanding amongst them. It's kind of like having a car repair shop with, with 10 bays, 10 mechanics, and 10 cars to work on. Everybody can get their car worked on, but they all operate at different speeds and having to be monitored at different times to add more work into the different car bays. Well, what's multi-threaded like? Multi-threaded is essentially like having one repair bay with 10 mechanics and 10 cars to work on, but not all cars can get into that repair bay. And it's up to the operating system to decide what work is done. In this case, uh, up to a shop manager to say, ah, you can pull Larry's car in, you can pull Willie's car in, you can pull Sarah's car in, but somebody has to monitor for that. And what we settled on was async IO or asynchronous IO, which is a really cool type of concurrency that still deals with a single processor and a single thread, but it uses cooperative multitasking. So essentially one, one car repair bay, one mechanic still have 10 cars, but that mechanic can say, you know what? I'm gonna work on this car. Oh, I need another part. I don't have it. So take that car out, put it in the parking lot, bring another car in and work on it, it needs to have its paint dried, pull it out, put it back in the parking lot, pull another car in. As a system developer, we get to define when it's okay to swap out for other waiting tasks. And we know that IO bound tasks are great to swap out because we're waiting for network or disk or some other API processing to happen. And as we identify that, async IO is able to switch away to the next task in the event loop. So this, this queue or event loop monitors and controls the processing, maintains the state and the awaiting tasks. With cooperative multitasking, here's how async IO would do it. We start a task and just like before, we send an API call out. We know that we have to wait for that API call to finish. So we go ahead and spit out another request because the server that we're dealing with is able to handle more requests than our single threaded endpoint can do, right? And we know we're gonna switch to another task. Okay, at some point, we're gonna start getting responses back from that API server so we can complete the processing and complete it even more and more. And we can see overall the runtime is shorter because we're dealing with swapping in and out the processes as we're waiting for completion from another dependent system. 
here's a fun example. And this is showing sequential processing. And what I'm using is the Deck of Cards API, which is a free open API endpoint on the internet. And you can use it to learn about APIs. We're gonna use the requests library, which is very common in Python programming for doing a REST API call and import time so we can do some time stamping. We're gonna create a loop to do 104 instances, essentially 104 cards, two decks, right? We're gonna get a card or draw a new card, and then we're gonna figure out what the value and the suit of that card is and do that 104 times. And then when we're done, we're gonna print out the, res uh, the end time here. So a little over 12 and a half seconds. Can we do better? Possibly. Uh, your mileage may vary based on your network speed and how much load the deck of cards API server is dealing with at that time. But let's pivot now to using cooperative multitasking with async IO. We're gonna swap out request module or library for AIO HTTP. So this is a, a specifically written library that understands asynchronous IO. And there are other ones like AIO file for file operations, AIO DNS, AIO AMQP, if you're doing message bus technologies. And if you're doing things with databases, you might use AIO PG for Postgres, AIO MySQL or ODBC. And if you're dealing with really slow devices, you might use async SSH. So what we're doing here is identifying which functions need to be handled asynchronously. And since this is a small script, we'll just use our main, uh, our main function. We will also define another async with this AIO HTTP library and the client session method. So this is like in Python when you do an open file as, or open file with, you see uh, the same kind of construct here. We're gonna do the same kind of loop, and we're gonna also use async with that session get method as a session handler for response. We identify a wait condition, waiting for the response to come back as JSON and print out the results. So as it's going along, it senses I've sent an API call out, I'm waiting for a response. While I'm waiting for that response, I can send another call out. Still waiting for a response, send another call out. And what we saw here was about six seconds to do that. So a 52% improvement. Again, your mileage may vary. So we wanted to deal with API changes too. So in our second try, we wanted to use the open API spec or Swagger and read that from the Meraki dashboard API to say, show us what the APIs currently are in your current development state. And what's neat about open API or Swagger is as the developers are working on developing APIs and documenting them, it automatically generates the documentation and it's useful in a way that's programmatically available to us. So we can extract things like, show me all the get methods, show me all the rest uh, post and put operations. Well, in this case, I just wanted all the get methods, but I also wanted to be able to skip certain API methods that were not useful to us. So if you've used Microsoft Visual Studio Code or VS Code, you know there's some cool plugins for it, like this CSV to table plugin that allows me to see all of the API operations and I can define logic to say, go ahead and skip this or use another type of logic rather than the default information that was built into my script. When we ran this in development a second time, it worked out to 13 hours, which is awesome. We reduced it 77%. <laughs> so we were really happy with what was going on now. When we run it, this web page is generated. And at the top, we see some statistics and parameters about our environment in Meraki. The table below that shows us our setting scans and we're storing them in a Git repo so we can use the Git hash as a unique identifier. In the table at the bottom, we see a difference report. So when we run our difference engine, we can compare the current scan with the previous scan or we can compare it with any two scans that we'd like. And then when we click a hyperlink, we see a list of the devices, networks, and organization parameters and settings that have changed. 
And if we're interested in any of these, we click on one of those and then we get a nice colorized and highlighted difference report. Again, on the left-hand side, our current scan with on the right-hand side, the previous scan, again, in JSON format for output. Now, if you liked what you saw, here's the QR code and URL to go to Cisco DevNet Automation Exchange. We have released this into the open source community. We want you to use it. We want you to participate in the community to add new features. And if you don't want to participate, that's fine too. You can download the code, fork it off, do your own thing, and still enjoy the information and effort that was used to create what you saw. If you're interested more in async IO, here's another QR, QR code and URL to the DevNet Snack Minute video that we did on async IO. In conclusion, what I want to do is just leave you with the thought that you can do it too. Okay, APIs allow us to extend functionality to suit need. And once you've exhausted all of your ideas around sequential processing, consider async IO and cooperative multitasking because you probably are getting tired of doing things one after the other. You've got more work to do than you can handle. Thank you for your time. And I hope to see you sometime soon at another DevNet Create.